Now we are going to uh, move forward the lecture by Professor Abraham Neyman, Professor of Economics uh, from Hebrew University. Professor Neyman. Okay. It's a great pleasure to speak here. And I'm sorry for you that instead of watching now the beautiful girl and the beautiful mind, you, you, you have to watch me and listen to this talk. And I'll try in the course of this talk uh, to tell you a little about what I'm doing. I assume that uh, not the mathematical background of not all of you is uh, sufficiently high to go into the details, or even if it is, that you are already tired. And uh, I'll try to do the mathematics as low as possible, or just to touch the... Uh, the main points, and uh, I'd like to say that at the end of the talk, I will pose a problem that if somebody solves it, provides a positive answer, I would invite him to a dinner in any place of his choice, including a business class ticket, and if it will be solved with a negative answer, will prove that some conjecture is not true, only the dinner at the place of his choice. So, I want to bargain some more. How many co-authors can one bring? <laughs> they will have to, sh to flip. Uh, okay, they could share the, 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 the business class ticket with two uh, economy tickets. Okay. So, the topic is continuous time stochastic game. Yes. So the topic, the title is Continuous Time Stochastic Games. And I would like to tell you about myself. I am very much interested in what's going in the real world, including soccer, and including financial crisis. And I know that it's a painful topic to mention here, but I'll mention it a few times. And so I'm interested in these topics. And at the same time, in the background, I'm trying to try to think what will be the corresponding game theoretic model that will enable us to tackle this type of topics. So let me give you two motivating examples. The first one is the financial crisis. So first of all, if you look on each financial crisis, it had been forecasted by many economists. Many, ad many other experts claim just before it's happening that this time is different. And there is a famous book with this title for those who are following uh, macroeconomics and the uh, famous book. No comment on the book, but uh, I took these words from there. And many economic experts focus on financial crisis that never materialized. And those cautioning of her coming crisis have no idea of the time of its occurrence. Many who had correctly predicted the crisis as, had warned that it is imminent when, in fact, it occurred many years later. And if you think of the financial crisis of 2000-2001, uh, I think the first flag has been raised by Greenspan, where he mentioned the word uh, exuberance, irrational exuberance. This word has been given to him at the same day of the meeting by uh, Schiller from Yale, who got all the credit for forecasting the financial crisis. But if you look on the prices of the, financial cri of the stock market before 96 or at the time of this announcement, it was still significantly below the prices that occurred after the crisis. So it didn't fall. The warning were before, but nothing. Uh, it was not. The calling of the time was not correct. Second, the other extreme, sorry for all the Brazilians that I'm speaking also on soccer. So... Is what? Argentinian. Okay. We have, a, we have a secretary, 
an administrative in our Center for Rationality in Jerusalem. And when I went to tell her, uh, wish you do well in the later stages, she said to me, for us, we already won. Brazil is out. For us, that's enough. We don't care anymore. <laughs> so, okay. So if you observe a play of a soccer game, or you know the quantity of both competing team, teams, we can recognize a clear advantage of one team over the other. I wouldn't say what is the advantage in Brazil against Argentina, not to take any risk here. Therefore, a correct forecast is that the stronger team is more likely to score the next goal than the other team. However, it is impossible to be sure as to which team will be the first to score the next goal. And moreover, it is impossible to forecast the time of the scoring. I am always uh, puzzled with various commentators that are speak of the game and try to analyze why exactly what happened in the minute 42 of the game, the team A scored against team B. They try to find specific events for that particular scoring of the game. In my view, this type of analysis doesn't have uh, any value. So, in both examples, <clears throat> the state of the economy or the, scale, the score of the game can dramatically change in a split of a second. And players' action impact the likelihood of each state change. So, motivated with the soccer example, and some issues that come with soccer, I have a graduate student, and I posed him a problem to develop a theory, and when he failed, I started to take it on myself. And uh, I'll tell you what type of uh, insight you could sometimes get about soccer later in the game. So, the question is, first of all, what is a game model that captures a lot of the issues that <coughs> we are facing in either these uh, financial interactions, economic interactions, uh, that have an abrupt change of a state from a score of 1 nil to Germany to go to 2 nil and then to 3 nil. So it's an abrupt change. It happened in a particular second, in a particular minute. And it is impacted by what the players are doing in the game. So this is what's called the stochastic game is a perfect model to try to analyze such situation. So I'll start to tell what are, and that's an old model introduced by Shapley in 53. And after finishing its description, I would tell its shortcoming and what is the need for the new tool that will enable to analyze uh, few of the situations. So the, possibility, the possible change of a state between different stages of the, of the interaction, it enables, it takes account of such effect. And the likelihood of each change is impacted by the player's action. So it's not a change that is given from God or somebody out of the interaction is generating, but the actual players of the game affect where we are moving. If you think of Brazil against Germany, so, <laughs> so the actual, I'll tell you at the very end why it's not so terrible that it was 7-1. <laughs> uh, so so if, <clears throat> if you look, obviously, the probability of scoring another goal and so on, these things were being affected by the players' actions in the game. So what is the game? So how do, could we think about a stochastic game? So it proceeds in stages. And that's a general uh, point here of view. We as game theorists want to have a nice closed model. So most of our, our models of repeated games, etc., we have stages. Stage number one, stage number two, and we try to analyze what is happening in these stages. So, it proceeds. so the state T, the time T, the game is in a state which we denote ZT. This state is observed by all players. So that's the common information of all the players that I know at this time. Thereafter, players choose an action profile AT. When I say a profile, it means all of them choose simultaneously their own action. 
the game moves to a new state, zt plus one, so that's the state in the next stage, and the current stage, zt, and the action profile a at time t affect the conditional distribution of the next state. So just the present actions affect what is going to happen in the next state. In a play, when we want to describe what happened in a game, we simply start with the sequence, the initial state Z1, the initial action profile A1, Z2, and so on. So, to describe the game, why it's once, okay. So we have, first of all, to, we have to specify the set of players. So when it's a soccer game, it's two teams. You could think of Brazil and Germany, I'll, uh, <laughs> but it could be Argentina, that's one, Holland, etc. So a set of players we have. It need not be two players. It could be a large number of players. We have a state space which describes the evolution of what the things are stating. If you look on soccer, the state of the game at every time, moment of the game is the score, 1-0 to one team or 3-2 or whatever it is. And then for every player I, we have a set of possible actions that they could take. In the common literature, stochastic game one is allo allows all sorts of these actions to be state dependent, so to depend on the state Z, but for simplicity of notations, and there is, in many cases, no loss of generality, I assume it's the same set of actions. Then we have payoffs. <coughs> we have stage payoffs. So the stage payoffs is some function that is a function of the current state, the current action profile, and that's the payoff to player i. It's convenient to think of g as the vector payoff, one for each player, and as you see, it depends on the state and the current action, so it's defined by some function from the state times a to rn. And then, we have a transition. So, as I told you, the direction of the player and the given state affect the probability distribution of the next state, so this is standing for the next state, when they take now the action Z and A. So the ingredients defining the stochastic game, oh, this B is, doesn't belong here. Okay, so this is just to describe the data that we need to define a stochastic game. But I claim that this stochastic game for many purposes is not sufficient. There is some lack in this model because in a deterministic time DT will stand for deterministic time stochastic game. It cannot capture the important common feature of the two motivating examples that the probability of a state change in any short time interval is infinitesimal. So there we know that the probability is exactly either a time one or a time two or a time three and so on. We cannot have in this model the possibility that this time is continuous and it is, could happen in any one of these. So, this important feature can be analyzed by studying the asymptotic behavior of a sequence of stochastic game where we think of the stage duration to go gradually to zero. So, we look on the stage going to zero. The individual states represent short time intervals that converge to zero. And the transition probabilities to a new state also have to converge to zero because I wanted to say that if every infinitesimal amount of time, the probability of changing, moving to another state is very small. <clears throat> so the probability <clears throat> of uh, Brazil scoring at the minute at 23 and 30 seconds is close to zero. Yes, give me any small interval, it will be very close to zero. So, to define such a sequence of games, you define a parameter delta that represents the duration of the stage. And for every delta, you consider a game where the payoff, the payoff and the probability transitions are a function of delta. So the play is the sequence Z0, I switch from starting at one to starting at zero because it's good for when we move to continuous time. It's here a typo, but uh, it's in this anticipation. And 
we shouldn't understand the state ZN of this game as the state of the game, of the, of the soccer game, of the economy, of whatever kind of continuous interaction we think, at the time that is N times delta. So delta is a short time interval. A tough time, tell me, please, okay? So the question, the first question that uh, arises is under what condition? Yes, we have here a family of stochastic game with short stage duration. We have here some parameters which are the transitions and the payoff which depend on delta. And the question is, when can I say that they have some form of convergence? Okay. So the characterization of this type family of games that do converge is given in a paper of mine, Stochastic Game with Short Stage Duration in 2013. This was a volume in honor of 60 years of the, Shap of the Stochastic Game paper by Shapley. And uh, where in this paper, in addition, it's quite a lengthy paper. And in addition, we have there an extensive study of the asymptotic behavior of the equilibrium in this type of sequence. So we don't only say that this models this and it converges to something, but also tell what happens to the equilibrium in this sequence of games. But if you think a little more, if you think of uh, rational numbers, and the young, you want to think of what do the rational numbers converge to, you have sometimes a sequence of rational numbers that converge to an irrational number. So a natural question in this, such a setup is to try to think, if we have this type of game, what is the object that the idealizes all the features of these games in the limit? What is the limit of such games? And the limit of these games are the continuous time stochastic game. When I started, I didn't know that there is any work on this topic. And then I discovered that in 64, an author by the name Zarichson wrote a paper called Markov Games. And basically the model, it was a two-person zero sum. The model was uh, essentially the model of continuous time stochastic games, two-player zero sum. But he didn't address some of the conceptual difficulties that appear when you start to handle continuous time games. When you have continuous time games, there is one, I wouldn't touch it too much here, but there is one critical problem. In game theory, we usually define a strategy, what the player does at every point of time as a function of everything that happened in the past. It is not the right definition in continuous time. Because there would be many such strategies that would have no meaning at all. It means you wouldn't be able to integrate from the strategies anything about telling what will happen in the game. So one is to switch to a larger class of strategy. The earlier studies of continuous time stochastic game have basically taken a shortcut and haven't considered all strategy in these games, but considered only all those strategies such that the action at every time depends only on the time and the state. So you cannot basically have any reciprocity argument, etc. Okay? And moreover, so if you have such a strategy, then you could more or less work with it. And what we discovered is that, how much time I have? Okay, very good. What we discovered is that there are new results. And each one of these new results is, was also supported by the finite approximation. So you get a result on the limiting model so you say, okay, the middle model, you could think this is the model, but you always want to try to see if you could back it up with results of the finite state duration when the stage goes to zero. So all these new results on the continuous time stochastic ba games are backed by such asymptotic results. So what do we have in a continuous time? What's the feature? We have frequent action choices. I could change it in any measurable way that I want in when I uh, play the game. So I can change my action as frequent as I wish. State changes over time, as in the stochastic game. 
Stage payoffs depend on the current state and actions. States transition depend on current state and actions. So the ingredients will be the same as before, almost the same as before. Just the transitions will be a slightly different object, which I'll define shortly. So N is the set of players. <coughs> we assume finite. A, the action profile is finite. Z, the state space, finite. And one of the reasons of uh, working with finite, it's not that you cannot extend the model to an infinite state space or infinite action spaces, but the positive result, two things. The positive results are mainly the difficult ones for this setup. They don't hold if we weaken any of this assumption, but this will be the result at the very end of the talk. <coughs> and B, there is a conceptual thing. If I want to study these games with these continuous state changes, if I have a finite state space, it's, it must be, or a discrete state space, it, all changes must be discontinuous. So in the examples that we mentioned before, they were all discontinuous. So we have a, pay, a stage payoff. So when we look on the game uh, evolving over time, so for every time t, we could define what is the action profile in the action profile set A, what is the state, and this changes with z, and what is the payoff function, which is a function, like before, of the current state z, t, and a, t. Obviously, you could interpret it as a density of the payoff. And then comes the new ingredient, which we have to think a little. And sorry for mentioning here again the game of Brazil against Germany. So if you look at some minute of time, and the score is 2-0 to, uh, to Germany. And then they continue to play. And you observe. You are the coach. You think, what's, what's going to happen? So basically, hmm? another example. OK, OK. Let's, it's too touchy. Let's go to the, uh, to the games in, uh, to the games in, in uh, England, OK, in the, or the Champions League. Uh, I think I'll give later an example. I think I'll give later an example, some moral from that story on the champions on the uh, UK league games. So let's focus on that. If you look on a given game, and you look on Chelsea playing against West Ham, so you say there is some advantage advantage to Chelsea, and you think in this situation, the way that they will play. It might be that Chelsea will score, on average, in expectation, two goals in a game. You cannot know when it is, when the goals are being scored. It's not half time at the end, or one third and two third. So the way to model it is to define the intensity of scoring a goal. So if you start at the beginning, and you say two, so it means that in every single minute, the probability of scoring a goal is, so the expectation will be two in the entire game, in every minute, two over 90. Assuming the game lasts 90 minutes. So two over 90, one over 45. That's the probability of Chelsea scoring a goal. In every minute of time. How many goals Chelsea will score in the game? We don't know. It's a stochastic variable. Who knows the property of this stochastic variable? It will be what's called the Poisson distribution with expectation 2 in the entire game. So there is some distribution which I could know what it is. <coughs> and West Ham is scoring on average one goal per game. So it means that in every single moment of time, they would score, the probability of them scoring is 1 over 90. And then the total number of scores that they will <coughs> that they will score will be a Poisson distribution with expectation one. That's a, an exercise in probability for those who know probability. Still, it might be possible that in the course of the game, you take two independent Poisson distribution, 
one with average two, the other one <coughs> with average one, it is still possible that West Ham will win or that there will be a draw. It's only an expectation. It's not something for sure. So what should do when the players are playing this ratio of two to one is a function of how the teams are playing. <coughs> West Ham could switch, if they want, to another system of playing to bring into the game another attacker and to take out another defender. And then maybe it will be a play such that Chelsea will score on the average five goals in a game. So every uh, 16 forget me, every 18 minutes they will score an average goal. So, but this is the game. But West Ham will score two goals. Okay? So a priori, probably if you will make the computation of the Poisson distribution, you will discover that to start with such a system, it's not worthwhile. It's not good to start with such a system because the likelihood of you losing is more than in the previous one. But if 60 minutes have passed, and Chelsea is leading to zero, and now there is a shh. It's not an entire game. And if you could switch the tactics of the game to impose such a distribution, I don't know exactly, didn't make this explicit computation, then it might be worthwhile for you to switch for West Ham, to switch the style of the game. Could I come back to Brazil, Germany? So, how come that the score was 7-1? Okay? I could tell you a few reasons, but I think I want the reason that is related to what I'm talking here. After Germany scored two goals, and maybe in the game, a priori, it might have been a ratio of 2-1. to one. Now, if they continue with this ratio, they will get very likely a loss. So it's worth for them to change the play of the game in such a way that they are risking a lot of goals at the probability of their scoring more goals. So the defense is very weak. And therefore, after 3 0, you change it even more. So you have an acceleration of scores in cup games when one team is losing to the other. So after a given amount of time, so I said I'll speak something about the, uh, <coughs> the UK league. So I was thinking, I asked my student that was working on that, uh, look on the quality of coaches in the UK. Let's try to see who are the coaches that are navigating better the rate of scoring the style of the game as a function of the results evolved. And who was first? You know the coaches in uh, Ferguson. So, f hmm? no, I think Ferguson was the best coach in this aspect. You know, different teams could have prepared them differently. But if you would try to compute the person distribution of how much he should have scored in every game and how much he should receive, you could have computed probabilistically how many points he should have in the league. He always said much more in every sample. So it means he knew how to navigate after they are leading to play a more cautious game and to do it in the right time. It's not just to say qualitatively. It's a question of uh, uh, complex optimization. And uh, my friend uh, Grant, who was uh, coaching Chelsea, was very poor in that. Okay? He was very basically scoring the same amount of goals as if he plays the same system throughout the game. <coughs> okay, so how do we define these rates of transitions? So, as I said, if I think of duration delta, and if I try to think what will be the transition rates if within time delta, from a st when we are at state Z and take the action A to state Z prime, if this will be this quantity, the only thing that makes it compatible with what we talked and what we gave the example of the game is that it is, this term is approximately <coughs> delta times some function like that. So this defines the transition rates. 
And obviously, if you make a little computation, if you want to see what is the probability of, <coughs> of same in the same game, it will be 1 minus that, where I take this to be negative the sum of those things, so that the sum will be equal to 1. So you get a condition of these transition rates, and they define to us the game. So the condition of these transition rates, moving to a new state, it's not negative, and staying at the same state is 0. And this, if we look at the previous definitions, it defines a, a kosher game. So here are the ingredients of the game. And now, how much time I have? Ten minutes, okay. So let's look on time separable payoffs in this continuous time stochastic game. So if we are given a list of measures here, I should wrote probability measures. Yes. The probability measures on zero infinity, so it's a one for each player. The continuous time stochastic game with time separable valuation w, w <coughs> is the game where the payoff valuation of player i of a play, so a play tells us the sequence of states and action, is this integral of this payoff at time t, dwi of t. Does it fit our soccer game? So maybe one more slide. Given a strategy, we could compute the expectation, the payoff to this strategy. And if you think of the soccer game, it corresponds to the game, the WI is the Dirac measure at the end of the game. So we don't care about the score in the course of the game. We just care about the score at the very end. So uh, it's a function just of the state at the very end, and the state is the score. And our theorem, for every time separate evaluation W like that, there is an epsilon equilibrium. For those who are unfamiliar with epsilon equilibrium, I'll just repeat it. For every epsilon, there exists a strategy profile such that for every player and every single deviation, this strategy, if you switch to tau i, you cannot improve this payoff by more than epsilon. Economists usually try to focus on exact equilibrium. I think people in the real world usually are happy with epsilon equilibrium. Sometimes they are happy with epsilon equilibrium because they don't know exactly the game. So they would prefer to have an epsilon equilibrium in a large family of games nearby. Okay? So one could have here given another result, which I haven't written, that if we have a sequence of such time-separable valuations that converge to W, there is a strategy that will be an epsilon equilibrium in all these games sufficiently far in the sequence. Okay, so again, just a reminder, a strategy defines in the continuous time game a probability distribution over the play, and therefore it defines a distribution on the streams of payoffs. And now I'm going to speak about the highlight or the main result of this type of work. And on something related to it, I'm promising this prize. So let's look on the situation, the economic situation. So we have the payoff. So usually we are thinking of discounting. But what does it mean, discounting? So everyone, usually to write a model and work with discounting, it takes one discounting factor and assumes that this is stationary throughout. There is no reason to think about it. You could have different discounting. You could have discounting that differ between the different players. If you look on uh, global warming issues, then uh, some players have a weight on the payoffs that they are receiving in some, their life horizon, and the central government should have a much more patient valuation of what's happening in the economy, so they'll have something spread much more. And moreover, the, the central government wouldn't know exactly how to evaluate the payoffs in different stages. They want somehow that it will be epsilon optimal maybe for all of them. So they have an idealistic solution there. So W is a general discounting. If for every player I, the weight that the measure gives to payoffs 
in the interval A plus C, B plus C, when I push C increase C, it's not increasing. So a stream of payoffs in the next interval of time, in the later interval of the same length, is worth to me less than before. So this will be a general discounting. And the main theorem is that if W, K is a sequence of generalized discounting such that for every A less than B, so uh, remember general discounting, we mean probability measures. Okay, it's important, but we'll focus here for So if W is a sequence of general discounting such that for every A less than B, this converges as K goes to infinity. So the weight, it approaches a given weight that I'm putting to the payoffs in time a between A to B, then for every epsilon, there exists a strategy profile V, a payoff vector V, and a positive integer K epsilon. I think of it as far away in the sequence. I want to get something asymptotic in this. Such that for every player I, for every possible deviation by player I into a strategy tau I, and for every K larger than K epsilon, the payoff, oop, so a typo here. Here it should be this a WK. Okay, so this WK should have, which for every K, here in the sequence there is nothing K. So this is W of K, the evaluation in the sequence of K. So this is at least this VI minus epsilon. And by a deviation here, you don't get more than VI. Uh, you cannot improve your payoff by deviation by more than this VI plus epsilon. Any question on that? Oh. So before I go to the last slide, I say I'll promise uh, some price for some problem. So, you know, this is a result about the continuous time game. A priori, it might look to us that, how much? It might, a priori, it might look to us that this continuous time game is a more complicated object. So if we prove these results in the continuous time, what will be the situation in the discrete time? So in the discrete time, this WK would be a measure on the integers. Discounting measure, it will be, it means it gives uh, decreasing, non-increasing weights to different integers. Probability distributions for each one of the players, a different probability distribution. And I want to know if for every such sequence, there exists such a strategy sigma profile and tau such that far away in the sequence, it means here it's WK and here, WK, we will get this inequality. So if you prove that, business class plus restaurant anywhere in the world. If you prove that it's not true, then uh, only the dinner on me, on a restaurant of your choice. And maybe uh, I was a little puzzled when I managed to prove this result. And, uh, and I was trying to understand why, what makes in many aspects, the continuous time is more complicated than the uh, discrete time. What makes it easier? Because sometimes if we think of equilibria as a kind of an agreement between the players, what we are doing, how we reciprocate, etc., in the course of the game. So what makes life easier in a continuous time that enables this theorem? And the reason is that reciprocity is much better facilitated by continuous time because in continuous time I could tell you play me, play this action. Maybe we'll jump to some state that is very good for me but very bad for you. But you are risking very little. Okay, so I'll gain five more than what I expect. You would lose one, but the chances of us jumping there is very small. And if you do that, I'll reciprocate you in the next stage. If we do in this free time, it might be too late. So there is a positive probability of transition, and therefore it is enabled this type of reciprocity. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Marilda, that she's not here. And happy birthday to Marilda, but she's not here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if there are questions. Because 
we are looking on a stochastic game. So reciprocating, there could be some state that is absorbing. We reach there, we stay there. Okay? So if you take an action that we are getting there, in the discrete time we'll get maybe for sure. Maybe it's deterministic. In continuous, I'll get there at one-tenth of a second. I'll get there only with probably one-tenth times that, and then I could still reciprocate. We are there. In the, in the sense to avoid this uh, yes, point. Yes, yes. The, the, the fact, it, it is not true if I wouldn't, if I take the sequence to converge, but it wouldn't be a decreasing sequence. So it plays a very important role in the proof. Let me say one more thing for those who are going after the talk to work on the open problem. It will be enough. I'm very interested in the problem. Yes. <laughs> it will be enough to solve it in the case that the way WK is 1 over K on stage 1, 1 over K on stage 2, 1 over K on stage K. So if we look, if, if we manage to prove the previous conclusion for this particular sequence, then I know to prove this theorem. So the so I have a, a kind of, to, to this part of result I call discounting robust equilibrium. To the previous one that I just mentioned, I call a uniform equilibrium. And one of the other terms in the paper is that you have uniform equilibrium if and only if you have discounting robust. Okay. Okay. Other questions? Thank you very much.